Good morning, everyone. How are we? A little cold. I would say I'm cold still. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you braved that short little walk from your house to the car and then the car to the church building because I know when I definitely told my husband to go outside and, and warm the car up for me because I wasn't quite ready to go out in it yet. But my name is Katie, as Pastor Scott was saying. I am one of the other pastors here at Sela Covenant. And this morning, I get to continue our sermon series that we're entitling Celebration. It's our Advent sermon series. And, um, you know, the, the word celebration seems really fitting because this past week itself, I have attended five different Christmas, like, church events, whether that's a leader party or a wildlife Christmas party or our staff Christmas party or jingle jam with the kids yesterday. Um, I also went to a birthday party in the last week and a half. I even went to the Seahawks game on Thursday. It has been an eventful week, to say the least. All of that to say, I did scream a little bit at the Seahawks game. If I am a little phlegmy or need to pause to drink water, I apologize. I got ahead of myself, and though my screaming didn't help them win, we sure had a blast. But all of that to say, I did want to just plug really quick. Scott mentioned it already, but... Like he said, we have our roaming Christmas party tonight for our high schoolers. It is our last big shindig of the year before we close for break. And like he said, we'll meet here at 5 o'clock. We'll pile into cars. So if you are a younger high schooler who cannot yet drive yourself, don't worry. We have leaders who are here and are ready to drive you. We're going to go to three different locations. We'll eat food. We'll play silly games. And then there's the white elephant gift exchange. It is truly, it is true white elephant fashion as well. Like you could wrap up a can of pinto beans and stick that bad boy in a box and that counts. It's meant to be funny. It's meant for everyone to participate. So if you are a high schooler, if you know a high schooler who is looking for something fun to do, send them my way. Give them my contact information. If you don't have that, come and get it from me after service. Like I said, it's going to be a blast. I'm looking forward to kind of this last little hurrah before we end for the year. It's kind of crazy to say that we won't be meeting with our youth again until 2023. Don't know how we made it through this fast, but we did. Um, but youth group plugs aside, this time of year is always filled with a lot of exciting fun, um, albeit it's exhausting fun. It seems like if you have enough friends or you're with your family members or, you know, you marry into a family who has their own family who does different Christmas things or you have several staff Christmas parties, all of that, you can get pulled in a million different directions. And as much as you might be enjoying yourself, you're... you're Christmas sweater might start to sell, smell a little funky in the armpits, especially if they're the light-up ones. How do you wash those things? You don't. You just, you just let them stink a little bit. You start to have like stomach aches. I don't know about you, but I've already had a lot of holiday treats, and I'm, I'm starting to get ready. I'm like, man, really glad that we're rounding out Christmas because I can only eat so many more cups of puppy chow or muddy buddies, whatever you want to call it. And if you, you start to run out of creative ideas for your white elephant gift exchange... And I will be the first to say this week I have been incredibly guilty of getting caught up in like the hullabaloo of it all. It feels like this week alone I've been trying to find ways to sneak one more program, one more event, get another task done before I run to the next thing. And don't get me started about the fact that I've hosted quite a few of these events because that sends me into a different kind of frenzy. I'm the type of person who is internalizing the whole time. Are people enjoying themselves? Should I have decorated it that way? Should I have planned these activities differently, made the food a little bit differently? Why isn't so-and-so here? Like, did they not want to come? It all gets so crazy that I kind of begin to forget about the why. And I will say, I like one day in particular, we had our leader Christmas party, and the whole time, my leaders can attest to this. Any of you who are in the room this week know we have a group chat with our, group, our youth group leaders, and I sat there just trying to find a day that multiple adults can meet. And I'm sure you guys have, can relate to this on some level when you're trying to figure out who, well, what day works for everyone. Almost none of them. And so we were going back and forth, and I finally sent the last text, and I said, you know what? We're just going to do Sundance for an hour before we have to get to wildlife after that for our middle school group. Um, and I was so upset because I was like, man, we could have done a party and I could have hosted them at my house and it could have been this, that, and the other. And I was so upset and didn't understand why it wasn't working out. And it wasn't until I sat down and we like actually got there that I was like, okay, it's totally fine. And what actually matters is that I'm here with my people. It's about celebrating them and being together and coming together and saying, you know what? This has been an awesome school year so far, and we get to look forward to what's to come. And so God humbled me in my experience. He reminded me that I needed to come back to my why. Um, in essence, this year, this season is all about 
focusing on what the season is really about. And for that reason, I've entitled this sermon, Adoration is Our Why. And I would say that this sermon really exists to expand upon what the two previous sermons have already laid groundwork for. In week one of the Advent series, I opened up with a sermon that we entitled Anticipation. And it wasn't just anticipation for the birth of Christ. That's what this time of year is really focused on. But it's also for the return of Christ. That in our patient waiting for the Messiah... We were also then told, you know what, after the Messiah comes, he's going to depart, and then we get to look forward to a day when he comes back, we see him face to face, and we live eternally with him in heaven. And then, last Sunday, Pastor Scott kind of continued on that idea, saying, starting a conversation where when we're waiting in anticipation, we're not just called to wait and sit there, that we're called to an action as well, encouraging us that we aren't just called to sit and wait because we know that we're saved, we're supposed to do something because we know that we're saved. That before Jesus left, he gave us a mission. So if you haven't already had the opportunity, I encourage you, go back onto our YouTube or our Facebook page, our sermon archive on our website. You should watch these. All of these sermons together are meant to show what it means and why this time of year is called a celebration, why we're declaring that it's a celebration. These kids came up, and they celebrated their little hearts out. I don't know about you, but I was just bobbing my head and seeing Russell in the middle with his big sparkly tie and he was grooving. That brings me joy. That's what we're supposed to look like this time of year. We are supposed to celebrate because there is good stuff going on. So let's get started with today's message. So for those of you who don't know, I have an intern this year. His name is Logan. He is awesome and he's helping me out with all of my middle school and high school events and he comes to wildlife and young life with me as well. Um, but part of what we do throughout the week, something that I have felt called to do um, as I pastor him and guide him in what it looks like to maybe approach um, a career with ministry, some leadership development. And right now in our leadership development, we're participating in a devotional, and it's called People Over Program. If you have the Bible app on a smartphone, you can find it there. It's a pretty short, I think it's like a five-day devotional plan. But one of my previous pastors used to say the phrase People Over Program all the time. It was always to remind us of our why. So when I saw the plan, I immediately thought, oh yeah, this is what we have to do. Because when I was just entering youth ministry as an intern myself, I remember being so encouraged. Like that small little phrase completely changed my frame of reference for how to do ministry with young people. He used to say it to remind us that it isn't about how well a program goes over or that we're supposed to lose sleep and agonize about every t detail. And it also wasn't that he was telling us not to do things with excellence. We always strive to make sure if we were going to do something, we did it well. No, what he was talking about was bigger. It was more about how we can get so wrapped up in the details of a program, when it happens, how it happens, that we completely forget why it's happening, that it's about people. It's not about the event itself. And I love how this devotional built upon what my pastor used to say to me. So I want to share a quote with you from it and from this week's reading that Logan and I did. And it sums up the idea. It says, the who is always more important than the when. Without spoiling the whole plan for any of you who might be feeling slightly inclined to go and read it for yourself, I'll try to relate it to what we're talking about here specifically. Because it doesn't just stop at the who being more important than the when. It is that the what is more important and the how we make it happen the very people that we try to honor with our actions are always going to be more important than whatever the actions are. And again, we still want to strive for excellence. We want to make sure that we serve people well, but we can't lose sight of the end goal. Because those are people who are important to God. He loves them very much, and he called us to love them as well. So when this plan says the who is more important than the when, what it is trying to tell us is to rid our brain of the agenda of it all. That if love of people in this world is supposed to be the why that encourages us to lead us to do anything that we don't have to get riled up about whether you know you get to meet for more than an hour at Sundance for some coffee that the timelines aren't as important the point is that we start to sacrifice and, and shift our own perspective to make sure that we're paying attention to the sweet moments that are provided to love them as well. Because God is in the sweet moments, and he's, he, he meets us in those moments as well. No one knows the place or the time when Jesus will return, and we're told that we're supposed to live in a way that could indicate that the second we walk out of church this morning, he could come back. We are called to live in a way that reflects that we are ready for him to come at any time, but also we don't know the day or the time. 
However, God has a plan and a timeline. So you don't have to get all wrapped up in the how and the when. You're supposed to keep your focus on who and how you can show the adoration of Christ to them. The who is always more important than the when. I want to show you a few different paintings this morning. They go along with today's main scripture, the portion that is really close to um, the Christmas story that we will be focusing on. I think you'll start to notice a theme with the artwork, and as I read through the scripture, instead of us putting words on the screen, I actually want you to follow along by looking at the pictures as I read to you. Um, this morning, I'll be reading a portion of scripture. It comes from the book of Luke. It comes, um, it's the scripture that points to the first witnesses of the birth of Jesus, and it's in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. It says, that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of the others, the armies of heaven praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem, let's see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's stories were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Now, I want to go back to these pictures. So the first one, Adoration of the Shepherd. This is what that's called. It was painted by Giorgione between the years of like 1505 and 1510. It's an oil-on-canvas artwork and it's supposed to show great contrast. You're supposed to be able to tell stark differences in the painting. So when it's in a little, it's not blown up on a screen and in a projector, you can tell a little bit better. The cave is super duper dark. It's supposed to contrast. And then on the left, you have this really beautiful Venetian landscape. And then you're supposed to see a difference that Mary and Joseph are sitting there in very colorful clothing. They look almost wealthy. They're shiny. Their clothes are more important, more significant. And then you have the shepherds nearby. They have some, some tattered clothing. There's some rips in it. It's supposed to signify that these shepherds had just left work. They had heard about what the angel said, and they were going to go and kneel before this newborn child in whatever their state was. This painting is almost supposed to create a sense of holiness, right? Because Jesus is laying there, and it's almost like he's illuminated. He's really special. There's a beautiful landscape by them. And these men who are below him, they're not as fancy as his parents are there, and they're kneeling at him because he's so amazing. This baby has been born. And then there's this next painting. This one is also called Adoration of the Shepherds, and it was created by Caravaggio in roughly 1609. So this is later. It's another oil on canvas, and unlike the former, it's darker. It's not nearly as pretty, in my opinion. You don't get the landscape that you see. But Mary and Joseph this time are actually kind of depicted relatively similar. They're, they're still set apart. They have red clothing instead of kind of the orange sepia-looking thing going on. This is me trying to sound like I know art things. I took an Art 101 class several years ago. It's been a while. But it's another oil on canvas. You have Mary and Joseph, but they look more humbled. They don't look like they're as above. Mary is sitting on the ground in what is the manger. She's sitting in the dirt, and he's wrapped in his claws. The style of the painting is more muddy in general. And the guy that actually painted this one I believe he wasn't even actually a believer in Christ. He was trying to evoke that the birth of Jesus was just a normal thing. He was just a normal baby. He wasn't the Messiah. And so he was of average wealth. His family was of average wealth. It was supposed to show the impoverished means in which this, this baby was brought into the world. No time to clean him up or put him on a hillside and make sure the sun was shining on him with the Venetian landscape in the background. But still, you see the shepherds are sitting nearby, their hands are clasped, they're sitting in adoration of this newborn baby that had been born and told of by the angels of heaven. So these are just two of numerous paintings entitled Adoration of the Shepherds. You can look it up. 
they just keep going. There are so many Venetian artists that were thought and read this story who wanted to show what it looked like in their eyes, or not even believers, right? I told you that that man, it, he was just trying to paint Jesus as a normal guy. So this morning, you saw those two different things from the different eyes of people painting based off of what they read or maybe they heard someone talk about, all trying to recount what might have happened that night thousands of years ago. You heard the evoked meanings of them. This is what they're trying to accomplish in this painting. But what is important about these paintings? Why, why in the first place would they depict the shepherds specifically and their adoration of this baby, these men who showed up in tattered clothing, who probably smelled like livestock because they hung out with sheep all the time? These men who are of lower average wealth, why do we care why they were there or what they were doing? We're supposed to care because they were chosen. Chosen as the first people to receive the good news that Jesus had been born. They were told, hey, there's something really cool that happened. You should go check it out. While they were busy doing what they did day in and day out, they're working with their flock of sheep, they were approached by the angel of the Lord that a savior had been born. And it says that even though they were afraid, they dropped what they were doing, they went to see what they had been told about. Surely if a heavenly army has gone out of its way to tell a group of us shepherds to go and see something, we should probably listen. That doesn't always happen to an average Joe like me. They were meant to go and see it. They believed this message was for them. And then as soon as they saw what they saw, as soon as they saw that the angel had told the truth and it was amazing and there was actually a baby there, they said, you know what, let's go and tell the people that we know, let's go and tell everybody that this amazing thing has happened, that we've seen it, that the angel said something that was true, the prophecy has come true, this is going to change everything. They became evangelists that day. God used average men as messengers of the good news. They turned their adoration for Jesus, for that tiny child, into their why. But why did they? We talked about it. We've been talking about it the last couple of weeks. <clears throat> they, people waited hundreds of years for this prophecy to come true. They had been told about it, and they were just hoping and praying, you know what, maybe I'll be the one who gets to see it. And so after they, it finally came true and these shepherds got to be a part of it, after the words the prophets had been speaking for generations had tangible proof in front of them, they had to go and see what, if what the angel had said was true, and they had to go and shove their, sh show, not shove, show their love and adoration to those people, and then they had to go and tell people about it. Because these normal guys were kneeling in front of a baby who was going to be the Messiah. They became set apart from the rest of humanity the moment they set aside their own priorities, their job, right? They left they left what they were doing. That was a pretty important job. They had to make sure the sheep didn't stray away, but they said, this is important. They left their own priorities, and they were set apart because they didn't just go and see and say, you know what, this is cool. Time to go back. They went and saw, and then they went and told people about it. They used the love and adoration they felt to go and tell the masses that God had been faithful to his words and his promises. Another quote I pulled from the devotional that Logan and I are studying right now is that God does not mind rearranging his schedule to accommodate his people, and neither should we. Again, that one hit me hard this week. This whole time I've been planning these events, and God was just trying to tell me, Katie, I'm trying, trying to tell you something. Here's your message for this week, but I think you really need to hear it right now. Those shepherds let their schedule be shifted and look at what it did for them. Look at what it did for everyone else. People got to hear the good news that the Messiah had arrived. I want you to think back to the beginning of creation. If you read in the first book in the Bible, the book of Genesis, God created a lot of things from water to light to vegetation and all of the animals. And he said he found it to be, to be good. Oh, this is good. I love these things. They're there's some cool stuff in creation. And then he recognized that the earth needed someone to take care of it. And so he thought, you know what? It needs humans. And obviously I'm paraphrasing. There's a, a little bit more intricacies in the story. Go ahead and read it if you would like to. But he said, I want to put humans in charge of everything that I've created. And I'm going to tell you right now that they are very good. I am elevating them. There's some cool stuff in creation. I don't know if you guys have seen how many different kinds of sharks exist. They're amazing. I love sharks. They scare a little bit of people, but they're cool. The ocean is vast, and God said we are very good. 
He trusted us to name everything, to take care of his perfect creation, and he only had one rule. And then when Adam and Eve broke the one rule, it broke his heart because he said we were very good, and then we strayed away from him. And then he came up with a new plan, though, for humanity so that we could fix our relationship with him. And if you continue to read throughout the Old Testament and even into the New Testament, you, you begin to see a theme that we, we kind of break our trust with God. We continue to mess up, and he gives us a new way to be in relationship with him, and he, he forgives us. And, and there's all kinds of stories that account for people doing this. But God just keeps giving us chances. He loves us so much that he was willing to keep letting us try and fix things in all of our own messiness. He didn't mind that he had to rearrange his schedule, right? Because he had a plan. It was just going to be that we were all going to be here and be perfect and we were going to follow the rules. And, and he was hoping, but he said, I love these people enough that they get free will. And when we didn't do that, he said, you know what? I'll come up with a new plan. If God can love us enough to give us chance after chance to prove that we love him enough to follow him and forgive us every time we choose to stray away or decide that something is more worth our time, can't we do that here on earth in like a much smaller scale? He's not asking for us to forgive people of their sins. He's asking us to maybe be okay with the fact that you're not exactly going to get to that meeting when you thought you would because maybe you have to stop and pray for someone. He does that even though he is capable of surpassing and does surpass all boundaries of heaven and earth. He has the power and authority and knowledge to just make things be exactly perfect, and yet he gives us the choice out of love for us. He decides to be patient in hopes that it would be our own quest propelled forward by free will that we would choose him and we would choose love. The Bible tells us in John 3.16, For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. There's a reason this is one of the most quoted verses in the Bible, if not the most quoted. I'm sure that you guys were kind of reciting it in your head as I do when people read this to me. It's because the message is huge as if it's been composed of several paragraphs. It's one sentence long, though. In our undeserving humanity, Christ humbled himself before us, took what he didn't deserve so that we could live eternally with God in heaven. That is a gift that we'll never begin to be able to repay. He modeled selflessness for us so that we could live servants' lives, so that we could humble ourselves before the Father and before our brothers and sisters in the hopes that they would know that they're saved by the same Savior who's described in John 3.16, that we're not meant to keep those things up for ourselves. We don't want to be the only ones who recognize the verse John 3.16. We want everyone who hears that to recognize that that is a truth that covers everyone. He did that and he gave us a choice. And that's a pretty big price to pay, giving his life for the sins of humanity to potentially get no's from people. If that doesn't show his love for us, I don't know what will. The fact that he still did it, even though he knew there are going to be people who don't pay any mind to his sacrifice. And then, in John chapter 14, verse 23, it tells us, Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. I like the way that this verse pairs with John 3.16. John 3.16 tells us what Christ did and why he did it, what it bought for us. But this verse, John 14.23, it tells us what we get to do in response. It is our response to John 3.16. All who love me will do what I say. Those who have chosen him and love him will follow his commands, dedicate their lives to him, do their best, and maybe mess up every once in a while. That's okay, right? Because John 3.16 exists. It's okay that we sin and we mess up. But we will live dedicated to loving people and to working for his cause. And then it says, my father will love them and we will come and make our home with each of them. We don't have to live in this life alone. We don't have to worry because we get to lean on him. We abide in him and him in us. We have built a home with him. He is building a home with us. We get to be driven because we believe that he loves us. And if we love him in return, then, then we get to live in that. We get to abide in the fact that his love covers everything and that we've been gifted his Holy Spirit, that his love for us is so all-encompassing that he said, here, take my power and go and use it in the world around you. You don't have to do it alone. I will give you all the strength you need. 
We aren't meant to let John 3.16 just be an easily quoted Bible verse that we understand. We're meant to live as reflections of John 14.23 so that other people understand the depth behind the verse John 3.16. And that can be backed up with different pieces of scripture as well. I'm going to read two more things that you've probably heard a thousand times if you have gone to church before. And if you haven't heard them before, great. I am so happy you get to hear them today because these are crucial. The first one is in Matthew chapter 22. It's verses 36 through 40. It says, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all of the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. It was a charge to start by loving God. He's just asking you to to do the thing that's easiest. The guy who created all of humanity. Love God. Several times over in the Bible outside of this verse, we're told that it starts because God loved us first. Well, we love because he first loved us. We're called to love God. And then it says we're called to love the people he created as well. He said it was equally as important. The next commandment I give to you is just as important as loving me. It's to love other people. He said it was equally as important. But how do we do that? How do you love other people who fail you, who sometimes put themselves in weird places that are hard to reach, who make decisions that we don't always agree with or understand? That's why we have the next portion of scripture that that I'm going to read to you. It reminds us how to love people. We just had the why, now we're going to learn the how. And it's in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. It says, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The Great Commission is our goal. That was the first, that, that's what we just read. And then the Great 